Okay, so we're going to start. Welcome everybody. Welcome to our ICU webinar today, Friday, June the 5th. Today, it is a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Robert Dixon. He's an assistant professor for the uh, Department of Medicine, Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care, and uh, in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. He is also the Associate Director of the Michigan Center for Integrative Research in Critical Care at the University. He is an editorial member in multiple recognized journals, uh, including the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. His uh, main investigation is in the field of lung microbiome and ARDS, for which he has obtained multiple NIH grants. He's going to talk to us today about uh, COVID-19, and ARDS, physiology, outcomes, and innovations. It's really uh, an honor to introduce him. Thank you very much, Dr. Dixon, for presenting us to us today. Um, I'm just going to uh, give a little bit of um, um, instructions to the audience. So remember, please place your microphones in mute. Use the chat of questions uh, within the Zoom to ask your question. And um, all the questions will be put together and will be asked uh, to Dr. Dixon at the end of the presentation. Um, at the end of the presentation, also, if you really want to uh, ask the question, uh, uh, you can raise your hand and I'll give you access to the microphone. So without further ado, I will give you to uh, Dr. Dixon. Uh, Dr. Dixon, you can go ahead. Excellent. Thank you, Javier. Let me see if I can smoothly share my screen. You see my slides okay? Yes. Great. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you, Javier, for the introduction. Thank you all, um, both for the invitation and also, uh, obviously, for all that you've done and continue to do during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Uh, I do have to uh, introduce myself with a disclosure. I'm a co-founder of a small company called SQL. Um, this is with some engineering colleagues here at the University of Michigan. Uh, we are trying to bring nanopore sequencing, so a type of sequencing to the bedside for medical diagnostics. This is relevant to a few slides I have at the end of the talk. We have no product. There's nothing you can buy, so there's nothing I can sell you. Um, but we are actively pursuing grants for this. So that's the only disclosure rele relevant to uh, today's content. Um, Javier gave me a nice introduction and I appreciate it. Uh, I was going to introduce myself as well, um, I am, as you mentioned, a pulmonary critical care physician. Uh, my clinical time is in our, um, our medical ICU as well as our county tuberculosis clinic. Um, recently, it's been all COVID all the time. Um, I've spent a lot of time in our COVID ICU and that's really the perspective I am um, uh, speaking through today uh, when I talk to you about this uh, subject matter. Um, but I am also, during the rest of the year, a physician scientist. Um, and I, as Javier mentioned, I study the microbiome's role in critical illness and chronic lung disease. We use microbial ecology techniques, so bacterial gene sequencing. We look at bacterial communities in the lungs and the gut, and we see how they inform our immune system, uh, our susceptibility to disease, how it's prognostic, and how I think it's a therapeutic target. Um, that is not what I'm talking about today. Um, so uh, some other time when we're allowed to uh, buy me a beer and I'll talk your ear off for an hour about that. Uh, and then um, finally, like a lot of you, I imagine I am a homeschooling parent uh, for the last couple months and a full-time Zoom meeting attendee. And uh, COVID has been disruptive in so many ways. Um, but I was proud that this week, uh, Russell, I have two school-age kids, three kids, two of them are school-age. Russell's my six-year-old and he stumbled across a big pile of deer bones that we turned into a jigsaw puzzle to learn about anatomy. Uh, and uh, life is strange. So I go from that back to the COVID ICU and then to talking to you all. So. Today, um, uh, I'm going to make a bold claim uh, that is not, may not strike you as bold, um, but it's that patients with severe COVID-19 disease develop ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and should be managed accordingly. And um, this, this may strike some of you as the most obvious and uninteresting uh, conclusion possible, um, but it may strike others of you as, as quite provocative and controversial. I suspect had I said it in February when we were first learning about COVID, um, you all would have fallen in the duh camp of this is not an interesting uh, uh, conclusion. Um, but I think it's something that actually needs to be uh, emphatically argued and, and uh, maintained now. And I'm going to spend about 45 minutes telling you why. The title of my talk is COVID-19 and ARDS, Physiology, Outcomes, and Innovations. Uh, 
uh, and that's going to be the three sections of the talk. Um, and we'll start with physiology because that really drives the rest of it. Um, it feels like forever ago, but it really wasn't that long that none ago that none of us had heard of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Um, this timeline from the, the Hopkins site is helpful. If you remember, um, the, the cases were first noticed in Wuhan City uh, in late December. Uh, the, the, the coronavirus itself was identified in early January. And then the crisis really bloomed in Wuhan in late January, early February. That's when they saw their surge in cases and deaths. Um, and the first case in America was late January. Um, and if you remember, the early reports that we were all sort of uh, eager to, to learn from um, used very straightforward language. They talked about this novel virus, the SARS-CoV-2. This, this one for reference was published on online February 21st, so mid, late February. And, and they used unambiguous language. They said compared with survivors, non-survivors were older, more likely to develop ARDS. Most patients had organ function damage, including 67% with ARDS. The fundamental pathophysiology of severe viral pneumonia is severe ARDS, they're more likely to develop ARDS. They were unambiguous that this is a nasty new coronavirus that seems to be highly transmissible and it causes something that we are all are quite familiar with, a 50 year old diagnosis called the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Flash forward a little bit, um, as you all recall, Italy was about a month behind Wuhan as far as when they had their real surge. Um, and March was when things really fell apart um, and they had their peak uh, in terms of cases in early to mid-March and deaths in late March. And then we, meaning the US, here's New York City and here is Michigan. We're about two to three weeks behind Italy in terms of our curve. Um, so we were, we were eagerly looking for reports from, March, uh, from, uh, from Italy uh, and other afflicted countries in March to understand what was coming our way for late March and April. And something really interesting happened at the end of March. Uh, within a couple days uh, through two completely different uh, media. One was this. So uh, I suspect most people on the call know the name Luciano Gattinoni, who is just a giant in the field of ARDS, respiratory mechanics, respiratory physiology in the ICU. Um, I looked it up today. I, I, I assumed that this was true and I confirmed it, that he has been studying, Dr. Gattinoni has been studying ARDS and lung injury since longer than I've been alive. And, and I don't consider myself young. Um, but Gattinoni, when, when Dr. Gattinoni talks about respiratory physiology or ARDS, people listen. And he published this online. It was a letter to the Blue Journal at the end of March. And the, the statement was in the title, COVID-19 does not lead to a typical acute respiratory distress syndrome. A day later on a, a very different form, forum, uh, YouTube, uh, this video was posted uh, by someone named Cameron Kyle Sedell, who's an emergency medicine doc from New York City. Uh, and he had actually a very similar conclusion. He said, does COVID-19 really cause ARDS? I believe we're treating the wrong disease. We must change what we're doing if we wanna save as many lives as possible. Um, and both of these got tremendous traction um, for, for intuitive reasons. So Dr. Gattinoni's paper was downloaded 150,000 times. This video was watched 800,000 times. Uh, and they were saying very similar things. So this is from um, the Gattinoni letter said the patients with, he describes the normal physiology we expect in ARDS, and he said, but the patients with COVID-19 pneumonia fulfilling the Berlin criteria of ARDS present an atypical form of the syndrome. Indeed, the primary characteristics we are observing, confirmed by colleagues at other hospitals, is the dissociation between the relatively well-preserved lung mechanics and the severity of hypoxemia. He was saying that we should find stiff lungs, low compliance lungs, but we're finding well-preserved lung mechanics. And he shared, this is the only data in the, in the letter, and in fact, it would become the only data in any of his communications in the subsequent two months. It said, as shown in our first 16 patients, figure one, the respiratory system compliance of 50 plus minus 14 milliliters per centimeter of water is associated with a stunt fraction of 0.5. So his argument was, this is not normally low lung compliance and ARDS, so something different is going on. And he, he made an inference. He said a possible explanation for such severe hypoxemia occurring in compliant lungs is the loss of lung perfusion regulation and hypoxic vasoconstriction. And this becomes a theme in everything that gets published beyond this, which is that ARDS we typically think of as something happening in the meat of the lungs, the alveolar space, it's epithelial injury, it's capillary leak, it's alveolar filling. This stuff should make the lungs stiff. We should get a lot of shunt. This is why we use lung protective ventilation to preserve the, the baby lung, which was Professor Gattinoni's own uh, invention or his, his own uh, uh, term for it. 
Uh, and something else is happening here and argued it was more of a, a vascular process that I'll come back to. Um, concurrently, so Dr. Kyle Sedell was posting YouTube videos that were widely uh, forwarded and, and, and watched and downloaded, arguing something similar, saying that this is not the normal shunt physiology that we expect to see in ARDS, it's something else. Uh, and he came to a similar conclusion, which is that this is a dysfunction of the vasculature, the pulmonary vasculature, that there's something wrong with hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And uh, he started talking about basically the same physiology as high altitude pulmonary edema happening in these patients at sea level. Professor Gatnoni has been extremely prolific with this, this observation and uh, his interpretation of it. So I mentioned that was March 30th, that the first one, the Blue Journal one, came online. Subsequently, in the subsequent two months, he's published six editorials, reviews, or essays in critical care, intensive care medicine, uh, JAMA, uh, all making this same argument. Um, and the argument is this. The respiratory mechanics of severe COVID-19 are different from those of ARDS, and he uses the phrase normal compliance or near normal compliance. He says COVID-19 causes hypoxemia via dysregulated pulmonary vasoconstriction and BQ mismatch. Basically says there's going to be a lot of dead space uh, rather than shunt um, in these patients. This indicates that COVID-19 lung injury is an endothelial rather than an epithelial process. So this is not the classic epithelial injury we should be seeing in ARDS, but rather some other process. And therefore, we should not be managing these patients with conventional ARDS approaches, like lung protective ventilation and our standard PEEP table. Um, to give you some examples of, of how he has put this, this is from uh, the, the essays I just, I just um, uh, referenced. He talks about patients with COVID-19 having relatively good respiratory mechanics, disturbingly COVID-19 ARDS, a disease that attacks from the vascular endothelial side has prompted early phase protocol driven choices that encourage using higher PEEP to confront the problems of hypoxemia and what was initially a rather flexible lung predisposed to overstretch. Here he is saying that there's normal respiratory mechanics or normal mechanics, normal specific compliance. He started saying that there's more than one phenotype of, of COVID lung injury and that most patients, he said 70% of patients have what you see on the left where they'll have this sort of peripheral ground glass, relatively intact parenchyma with, 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 with minimal dense consolidation uh, and they have normal compliance. He said that's the majority of these patients. Whereas on the right, you have this other type of patient that has more typical CT features for ARDS and more typical respiratory physiology. He called them type L and type H pneumotypes or uh, 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 phenotypes of COVID-19, um, describing what I just said. Uh, and again, here he is saying this type H pattern, uh, which is a minority, 20 to 30% of the patients are, are more typical for ARDS in terms of low compliance and more typical CT scans. And then uh, quite emphatically, and, and it doesn't get broader than in terms of reach than JAMA, but in his JAMA article on management of COVID-19 respiratory distress, talked about the standard approach to ventilating ARDS, which has shunt-related hypoxemia and low respiratory compliance, versus CARDS, which is now COVID acute respiratory distress syndrome, having relatively good compliance despite poor oxygenation. He said the key issue in this early stage is disrupted vasoregulation, where the pulmonary vasoconstriction that normally occurs in response to hypoxia fails to occur because of an endothelial assault that mismatches perfusion to ventilation and may result in profound hypoxemia. You'll notice there's no citation on that. There's, there's, there's no mechanistic study that actually demonstrates this. This is all inferred from that argument that they have normal compliance, so something else must be causing their hypoxemia. Uh, and he was, he was quite direct and emphatic in his management recommendations. So here he is in the table in the JAMA paper saying that in the majority of COVID patients, the ones that have normal compliance, he said, low tidal volumes are unnecessary, higher PEEP is ineffective, it creates dead space and adversely redirects blood flow. In these essays, he was saying that PEEP is quite injurious to these patients, it's gonna cause hemodynamic collapse and an extra pulmonary organ failure. Um, and he gave a talk at the European Society for Intensive Care Medicine, in which he said quite emphatically, if you give these patients more than 10 of PEEP, you will kill them. Um, meanwhile, so that, that's what was happening in the, in the medical literature, but in the popular press, uh, this and Cameron Weil Sedell's uh, argument gained quite a bit of traction. Uh, and here's Time Magazine saying, why ventilators may not be working as well for COVID-19 patients as doctors hoped. Here's, here's NBC News, why some doctors are moving away from ventilators for virus patients, unusually high death rates for COVID-19 patients on ventilators. Uh, 
Uh, and here's one directly referring to uh, Cameron Kyle Sedell's argument saying life-saving ventilators are destroying coronavirus patients' lungs, doctor says. It's all happening very quickly and it's happening on two fronts in the medical literature and in the popular press. But from the beginning, before we generated any, any new data to try to challenge this argument, there were some things that were suspicious, starting with that initial assumption that uh, respiratory mechanics of severe COVID-19 are different from those of ARDS normal compliance. First of all, the only data that Dr. Gatnoni had shared was in that first letter to Blue Journal. None of the subsequent ones had any, had any mention of it. And if you look closely at it, it doesn't actually support what he's saying. He's describing a respiratory system compliance of 50. And if you see on the histogram that's shared there, the, the, the median was between 45 and 50. He goes on to refer to this as normal, but that's not normal compliance. Normal respiratory compliance should be closer to 100. Um, this is quite abnormal, and it's actually, that's something that we see in patients with ARDS. So just, just that interpretation itself is problematic. Two, there, there was no Y label, uh, Y axis label here. So we actually don't know what's being reported, but this was only 16 patients. And if you count up all the ticks here, there's 67 measurements, meaning that there were at least four measurements made per patient. There's no method section telling us when these measurements were taken. Was this immediately after they went on the ventilator or subsequently? But um, it's, to say the least, to use a euphemism, problematic to be reporting four measurements per patient for only 16 patients to generalize for all of COVID pneumonia. Um, secondly, in his big JAMA paper, when he says here that, that COVID patients have relatively good compliance despite very poor oxygenation, there's two references cited, one and two here. If you do what you should do, which is actually read those references, you find that they don't support that claim at all. The first one is a report out of Italy um, from JAMA that literally did not report patients' compliance, didn't have anything about respiratory mechanics in it. The second one was that first report out of Seattle. So the first 21 cases uh, out of Seattle reported in JAMA. That also did not report compliance, but the same group subsequently in the New England Journal did publish uh, the compliance of the population and it was quite low. So the compliance of that initial cohort in Seattle was 29, which is quite low and two quite compatible with uh, prior ARDS cohorts. So already without generating new data, that's kind of fishy that uh, the whole argument rests on an observation that isn't really borne out by the data that's being cited. Two, um, the, the third leg, the third step in this argument that COVID-19 lung injury must be occurring by way of an endothelial process rather than epithelial process is at odds with autopsy data. So early on, we were getting these reports out of China that the autopsy results, both of patients who were on the ventilator and patients who were not intubated, showed textbook diffuse alveolar damage. It showed hyaline membranes, it showed epithelial necrosis, alveolar flooding, it showed everything we expect to see in, in bad ARDS. Um, so to say that it was an exclusively endothelial injury as opposed to an epithelial one is, is really not reconciled. Now, some of these autopsy reports, and this is quite consistent with subsequent autopsy reports, some of them have reported microthrombi, endothelial injury. Um, some of them have not, but what's been very consistent is there is epithelial injury. Diffuse alveolar damage is absolutely uniform across all of these autopsy studies. No one has shown someone who died of COVID-19 pneumonia that didn't have diffuse alveolar damage. So the question is how much of a contribution is from the endothelium, but the, the, the fact that it has the textbook epithelial uh, indices of injury uh, is really not, not in question. So that was a problematic aspect of the argument too. Um, the next big step in the story was a publication that directly challenged that first claim. So Corey Harden uh, and his group at Mass General and Beth Israel Deaconess, Deaconess published this letter in, all this is happening by way of letters, no one has time for actual full studies, um, in the Blue Journal. Uh, that was just a really simple and straightforward report, which is respiratory pathophysiology of mechanically ventilated patients with COVID-19, a cohort study. And I will point out while I'm on this slide that this has been downloaded less than a 10th of the initial Gattinoni letter. But they had a very simple study design. They took consecutive patients admitted to their hospital with COVID-19 pneumonia requiring mechanical ventilation. So 66 that they had all measurements on. And they just reported their respiratory mechanics, both their settings and their measurements, for days one through five. So here's P to F ratio, here's the plateau pressure, here's the PEEP, and here's the static pressure, the or excuse me, the, the compliance. And you can see a tremendous amount just from this one figure. For one, the median compliance here was about 34, which is low and perfectly compatible with prior ARDS cohorts. Two, there's no two phenotypes. So Professor Gattinoni was talking about the type L and the type H as if they're two different phenotypes. 
we know what phenotypes are in pulmonary and critical care medicine. So for instance, in COPD, one phenotype would be emphysema, one phenotype would be chronic bronchitis, or eosinophilic asthma versus non-eosinophilic asthma. It is distinct entities that sort of fall under an umbrella but have different biological underpinnings. What we see here is actually what we saw in Professor Gatnoni's letter, which is a continuum. There's a bell curve of distribution that is low in the middle, but it ranges from relatively preserved to quite, quite low. So there's no evidence here for distinct phenotypes. And two, it really doesn't change with time. Um, Dr. Gatnoni has made the argument that initially the compliance is high, but it's the ventilator that causes the stiffening of the lungs. And there's absolutely not even a trend here suggesting that. So this really cuts against that first step in the argument that I mentioned. We have more data now. So that came out relatively, uh, it was mid, early to mid-April. And subsequently, we had a few more reports out of Emory, out of Columbia, out of Cornell, of larger patient uh, populations. Um, and here's what they reported for their compliance. And again, for reference, um, about 100 would be normal. 50 is what Professor Gatnoni reported. 25, 35, 34, 27, 28. So it's, it's gotten boring to publish your COVID-19 uh, cohort, report their compliance, and show that it's actually quite low. For reference, what do we expect in ARDS? So here's the big perceive study that taught us about prone ventilation. Here's the supine arm, here's the prone arm. You can see that median was 35, 36. There were four big ARDS cohorts that went into deriving the Berlin criteria, ARDSnet, ICAP, ANZIX, and KCLIP, and they were all in the 30 to 40 range. So there is absolutely no evidence in the published literature to date to support the claim that patients with COVID-19 have high compliance compared to historic ARDS cohorts. What we wanted to do was not compare it to historic cohorts, but compare it to another cohort at the same center. Um, so this really undercuts that first argument, the respiratory mechanics of COVID-19 are different from those of ARDS. What we did with our data and our experience with our patients was compare patients who had severe COVID-19 disease. So these are patients who had molecularly confirmed COVID-19 pneumonia, who also had hypoxic respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation. And we had 132 for which we had physiologic data. We had 117 for which we had uh, outcomes data. And for a comparison group, we compared patients from our own center. So same docs, same ICUs, same nurses, same respiratory therapists, same management practices who had non-COVID-19 ARDS requiring mechanical ventilation. And this is a testament to a colleague of mine, Michael Schoding, who's also in pulmonary and critical care, who's been studying uh, ARDS for years now and has invested the time in really rigorously characterizing these patients. So every one of these patients had, was clinically adjudicated by three physicians, three critical care, critical care trained physicians, who all attest that this patient meets all criteria for ARDS. They think that is by far the most likely diagnosis. Um, and it's a mixed bag, you know, it's a, it's a medical and surgical. It's pneumonia, sepsis, aspiration. Uh, it's what we would all recognize as if you're gonna do an all comers ARDS study, who are you gonna find? And what did we find? We compared them first in respiratory mechanics. And on the leftmost graph here, we're showing you compliance. So what Dr. Gatnoni has said is high in COVID-19. And we're comparing the COVID-19 cohort with the non-COVID-19 ARDS cohort. And lo and behold, there is absolutely no difference at all. They are all stiff. There's variation, the heterogeneity within each cohort, but there is no meaningful difference between the COVID-19 and the non-COVID-19 ARDS patients. Moving on from compliance, ventilatory ratio. So many of you may know this index. Um, it's a way of estimating dead space if you can't measure exhaled breath CO2. Um, so it's a measurement of uh, respiratory efficiency. And the prediction here is that it should be very high. Dead space is supposed to be through the roof in, in the model that Dr. Catnoni and others have proposed if COVID-19 is different from ARDS. And what we find is that it is utterly identical. So in terms of ventilatory efficiency and CO2 clearance, there's no difference between your average COVID-19 patient and your average ARDS patient. Uh, and then the question you could ask is, well, are they really, is it really apples to apples here? Because did we intubate these patients at the same time point in their severity? So I, I'm sure you're all aware there was quite a bit of debate about intubating their folks like the mass general folks who were intubating everyone over six liters uh, nasal cannula. So they were not using heated high flow um, and they would be considered early intubators. We were not, we would give patients a trial of heated high flow uh, and typically it was an integrated clinical decision of when the tube went in, but most patients would get up to 60, 70, 80% uh, via heated high flow before we intubated them. So the question is, are they further along in the disease process? And at least in terms of severity of lung injury, no. So this is oxygenation index, which is like P to F, but it takes into account mean airway pressure. And there was no difference between the COVID-19 patients and the non-COVID ARDS patients. So in terms of 
oxygenation, ventilation, and respiratory mechanics, you cannot tell the difference between patients with COVID-19 hypoxic respiratory failure and what we would have called ARDS before all this. Specific to Professor Gatnoni's hypothesis, he would predict that if you compared patients with COVID-19 and ARDS in their compliance and ventilatory ratio, they should be far out right on the, on the x-axis here, high compliance with a lot of dead space. And what you can see is that they're not. The, the orange triangles are the COVID-19 patients and they fall squarely where the blue uh, non-COVID-19 ARDS patients are. So this is a, a, a direct comparison of these two groups and it directly undercuts any claim that the respiratory mechanics are different from those of ARDS. There's certainly no evidence that there's normal compliance, preserved lung mechanics, or near normal compliance, which is again, perfectly compatible with the autopsy data that's been published. So everything else in this argument really hinges on that first observation. There hasn't been any mechanistic work proving that there's anything uh, different about the pathophysiology of COVID-19 compared to other causes of diffuse epidural damage and ARDS. That's not to say that there isn't going to be something specific to the pathophysiology of COVID-19. It's also not to say there isn't endothelial involvement in uh, COVID-19 because we've always known there's endothelial involvement in ARDS. There's a paper I've been citing a lot recently from the 1980s where Professor Gatnoni showed in patients with obviously non-COVID-19 ARDS, there are considerable microthrombi and there's, there's profound derangement of EQ matching in ARDS. And we've known that dead space is quite prognostic in patients with ARDS. So it's not to discount the contributions of the endothelial side of the equation but we really should not throw out the window everything we've learned from ARDS over the last 15 years. And I think that definitely applies for argument number four here, which is that we should not throw out our best practices like lung protective ventilation and PEEP, according to a, a theory that really just is not borne out by physiologic evidence. So I'll ask this question, what else does everybody know about COVID-19 patients that isn't yet supported by data? So this idea that the lungs have normal compliance, which is pervasive, I don't know if it's happened to you too, um, but I've had residents on rounds tell me this, that we know that there's LNH phenotypes. I mean, they read JAMA, I don't blame them. Uh, but that the normal compliance, that the compliance of COVID is different from that of ARDS and it's reflects the endothelial injury. It's a pulmonary endothelitis. Um, that I think is just thoroughly debunked. There's just no data to support it and plenty of evidence to debunk it. But there's other things that we all know about COVID-19 that I would say have not really been proven yet. They suffer from a cytokine storm. They're especially hypercoagulable. They don't develop multi-organ failure until they're on the ventilator. This is part of that argument that it's the ventilators that are doing the real harm is that these patients are really fine if you just leave them alone. You just tolerate some hypoxemia, you give them heated high flow and you keep them off the vent and they won't get kidney injury, they won't get shock, they won't get extra, extra pulmonary injury. Uh, and then finally, they have especially persistent respiratory failure and high mortality. One by one, I'm, I'm increasingly skeptical of all of these. Um, the idea that they suffer from a cytokine storm um, as someone who studies ARDS and sepsis, I'm kind of sick of the cytokine storm hypothesis. This has been invoked since the 1980s for those conditions. It's really never borne fruit. It's not because we haven't tried. There have been hundreds of studies trying to blunt the immune response one way or the other in a targeted or untargeted fashion. It's never given us a molecular therapy that works. And what's interesting, even anecdotally on my side, is that the cytokines don't seem to be all that deranged in these patients. So we were part of an anti-IL-6 trial uh, for tozolizumab. And uh, when we uh, would enroll a patient in that, we would draw blood, measure an IL-6 level that would take five days. It's a send-out test, and it would take five days for it to come back. That's too long to wait. They get randomized. They get an anti-IL-6 agent, uh, and it drops their fever, and we think that we're helping them. And then lo and behold, the, the IL-6 level comes back, and it's normal. And if we actually look at the data, the, the, the IL-6 levels reported in these patients are really mild compared to other diseases. And just earlier this week, the group at Washington University put out a comparison uh, this is a preprint, um, but comparing uh, gene expression of inflammatory mediators in patients with COVID compared to influenza. Uh, and they make the argument that the, what you're seeing on the slide here is uh, if something is to the left of the green line, it's low compared to flu, and to the right of the green line, it's high compared to flu. Only a couple cytokines, IL-8, IL-6, were convincingly high in COVID patients, which argues against a storm. This is not dysregulated, it's not out of control immunity it may be a totally appropriate immune response to a persistent viral infection, uh, and we may be doing some harm by blunting it. Um, but also, in most respects, they exhibit profound type 1 and type 2 interferon immune suppression when compared to patients with acute influenza. So if anything, they have an, a blunted immune response compared to other causes of ARDS. Um, and it really does give me a pause. I, I, I really do not think that we should be using these experimental therapies outside of randomized controlled trials. 
I, I'm sure like you, have seen a ton of secondary bacterial infections in these patients. And I'm really not sure why we are so selectively, I know our centers have varied on this, but we have been very reluctant to give steroids to patients because we know that they increase secondary bacterial infections. And yet we'll pull out these expensive monoclonal antibodies that I could think you could make the same argument for. Um, so I'm not at all convinced that there is a cytokine storm here or that that's even really a biologically coherent hypothesis worth exploring. Uh, we all know that these patients are especially hypercoagulable. I've certainly seen it. I've done this weird thing that everyone's doing now where we get daily D-dimers. I'm finding reasons to vary my, my anticoagulation practices. I've certainly seen clots in them. But if I think back to H1N1, we saw lots of clots in those patients too. And I think back further, um, I, Carolyn Calfee made this point a week ago. She was taught in med school, don't be ordering D-dimers on hospitalized patients because they're going to be high. And only recently have we started routinely getting D-dimers on these patients in the hospital. And lo and behold, they're really high. In that same cohort that I showed you where we're comparing the COVID-19 and the non-COVID-19 ARDS patients, we compared D-dimers and it's actually actually higher in non-COVID-19 ARDS patients. Now, a caveat here is we weren't routinely getting them on every patient. There were only a quarter of patients who had them. Um, but it certainly does not read that there's something unique about this. All critically ill patients are hypercoagulable. Um, so it's, it's just not at all clear to me that this is a unique process to it or that we should be varying the practices that we've been studying in patients with sepsis and ARDS over the years. Finally, the argument that they don't develop multi-organ failure until they're on the ventilator is just straight up wrong. So with our cohort comparison, we could look at kidney injury and, and uh, LFT abnormalities in these patients. And on the left side of the screen, there's BUN and creatinine. On the right side of the screen is AST and ALT. And you can see that for one, uh, many of these patients have kidney injury, at, at least biochemically, evidence of high BUNs and creatins before the tube goes in. Um, something on the order of half have greater than the normal level, and about a third of them have what you consider significantly meaningfully high. And actually, most of them have LFT abnormalities too. So I think it's an unproven speculation that's probably not borne out that uh, really it's single organ failure until the, until the tube goes in. And then finally, a really pervasive one um, that I'm going to spend the second half of this talk on is that these patients have especially persistent respiratory failure and high mortality, which brings me to the second half of the talk, the second third of the talk, which is outcomes. Again, coming back to the medical press and the popular press, the early reports out of China were terrifying. Sorry. This is uh, one of that, that early series in Lancet, just reporting their experience in Wuhan. They said that of 32 patients requiring invasive mechanical ventilation, 31 of them died. So 97% mortality in this small early cohort. I'm sure many of you saw this paper in JAMA. Um, it was the Northwell uh, group out of New York City, or around New York City, in the New York area. And they reported that mortality for those requiring mechanical ventilation was 88.1%. And this was quickly retracted for a very good reason, or it was corrected, I should say. The press got hold of this, and you were seeing headlines like this. New study shows nearly 9 in 10 COVID-19 patients on ventilators don't make it. Nearly 9 in 10 COVID-19 patients who were put on a ventilator die, New York Hospital data suggests. This number came from a really inappropriate reporting of a profoundly censored group. The median follow-up at time of censoring was four and a half days. So this was, if you didn't have an ultimate outcome, extubated and alive or dead, at four and a half days, you were censored. So it excluded 75% of the patients who were stuck on a ventilator at four and a half days. That's where the 88% came from. They quickly changed the abstract and reported it this way, that 30 of the patients requiring mechanical ventilation, 3% were discharged alive, 24% had died, and 72% remained in hospital. Uh, and the mean discharge follow-up time was only four and a half days. So this is not reliable data. Um, you cannot make any inferences about say 28 day or six month functional return of uh, a status based on four and a half days of observation. Um, it didn't stop, for instance, as an exchange on, so some of you might know Nita Kadir, who's a pulm critical care doc at UCLA, who challenged Dr. Gatnoni on this compliance issue on Twitter. And he said, okay, if you're satisfied with 88% mortality, go ahead as you like. When the evidence will be published for many individuals will be too late, stay well appealing back to that argument from the first third of my talk, which is that he was saying that the fact that 88% of patients on vents with COVID die must mean that we're doing something wrong and it's because we're treating them as if they have ARDS. So I think that's a pretty cynical and inappropriate argument, but thankfully that same paper out of the Mass General Group that reported the ARDS compatible or congruent uh, compliance also reported their mortality data and showed that of the patients in this, the 66 patients, they had median follow-up of 34 days. A fifth of them underwent tracheostomy. 75% were discharged from the ICU. 11%, only 16.7% died. 
So obviously quite, quite different from 88% and quite different from the early Wuhan experience. We wanted to compare it in our group, because again, our intubation practices were quite different from those in the mass general group. They were intubating, if you were requiring more than six liters, we were using high, fluid, uh, high fluid nasal cannula. It's fair to ask if you're an early intubator, are you intubating patients who maybe didn't need it if you had a rescue or, a, or step up therapy? So in that same comparison of the COVID-19 cohort and the non-COVID-19 ARDS cohort, we visualized it this way. So this is a, a time to event curve. On day zero, everyone, no one is alive and breathing unassisted. Everyone's getting invasive mechanical ventilation. And we went out to 28 days and we had full follow-up on all of these patients. And what we wanna show you is what percentage are alive and breathing unassisted. So you're alive and off the ventilator. Um, or you, you received a tracheostomy and you're breathing spontaneously without, without positive pressure ventilation. And what you can see is that these curves overlap. If you just looked at a week, you would say, well, the non-COVID ARDS, there's more of them that are alive and off the vent. But the curves actually cross. And if anything, uh, it's higher in the COVID-19 arm. And our 28-day mortality in the COVID-19 was only 24% compared to 38 in our non-COVID uh, ARDS cohort. Now, this is not to minimize it. That's still that's, that's, that's one in four patients whose lives we wish we had saved. But it's to remind you that it's not nearly as bad as it was initially reported, either in the medical literature or in the popular press. And two, ARDS is bad. Um, even if this is just ARDS, it still has a very high mortality. Um, and this isn't something new to us. It's something that we've been studying for 50 years and, and we've, we've gotten better at over time. So I think a, a, an important myth of COVID-19 that we should dispel is that it has especially persistent or high mortality compared to ARDS, which again is not to minimize it, but to argue that uh, we should not drop everything that we've known about this other condition. Finally, with the last 10 minutes of my talk, I'll talk talk about innovations. So that's the physiology and outcomes part. Let's talk about innovations. In this, I'm wearing two hats. One is I'm a, again, a physician scientist working in uh, University of Michigan, but I'm also an associate director for MSERC, which is our critical care center. So every, every hospital has a heart center. Every hospital has a cancer center. We have a critical care center. Um, and really what MSERC is supposed to do is bridge the engineering school and the medical school. So all these engineer, engineers have these amazing solutions in search of a problem. Um, and they uh, have something to bring to the table for critical care crises that they didn't even know about. And COVID has, I've been very proud to be a member of MSERF during COVID because it's called to light uh, how much our colleagues in the engineering school have to offer. Um, I will make an argument that there's never been a better and a more important time to study critical illness um, for I think intuitive reasons. SARS-CoV-2 can be contained. You know, I, I like to think a year from now between social distancing and hopefully a vaccine, we can, we can make it so that it's just not nearly the public health crisis that it is now. But ARDS and multi-organ failure are here to, say, here to stay. Um, and this is sort of the silver lining I see to the first two thirds of my talk, which is even if ARDS, even if COVID-19 does cause ARDS, um, that's actually good because it gives us a, a tremendous opportunity to study ARDS, which kills 70,000 Americans a year anyway. So it's an amazing time to study something that will outlive SARS-CoV-2. And we know from history that great innovations emerge from times of crisis. So I'm a, a bit of a nerd for history. And one 10-year period I'm really interested in is between around 1945 and 1955. Penicillin was not discovered in the 50s or the 40s. It was discovered in the 20s. But it wasn't put to industrial production and widespread use until World War II. So it was the military that realized that its soldiers were not dying of acute trauma, they're dying of secondary infections, and that penicillin would be a tremendous advantage. So it was actually the US government that prompted um, the, the, the um, investigators in England to work with US pharma to scale up production. So our modern antibiotic era, as we recognize it, was really a function of the crisis that was World War II. Only a couple years later, the first randomized controlled trial, so I'm a TV doc, so I'm a fond of this, uh, study, but we knew that streptomycin might work for pulmonary TB, but the British government was devastated. Their economy was devastated by World War II. Um, they didn't have enough resources for everyone who might benefit from it. So some smart statisticians said, this is an opportunity. Let's randomize who gets it and we'll control for both obvious or explicit and implicit biases. Um, and the, this is literally the first randomized controlled trial. They had their Tabor 1 showing that there was uh, equalization across the groups. Uh, and lo and behold, it was successful. So the randomized controlled trial is maybe the most important thought technology of the 20th century in terms of biomedical research, and that came out of crisis as well. And then finally, the most important one is probably really our field, our discipline of critical care medicine. I'm sure most of you know this, but it came out of the polio epidemic in Copenhagen. So early 1950s, they had hundreds of patients who had respiratory failure, 
um, neuro neuromuscular respiratory failure from uh, polio virus. They only had one tank respirator and six cuirass respirators, so basically negative pressure ventilators. Uh, and they said, let's provide mechanical ventilation. So they performed tracheostomies on patients and they paid medical students a pound 50 per shift and they turned the mortality from 80% to 40%. So really our field of critical care medicine emerged from a public health crisis, much like, sorry, uh, much like COVID. So um, there are very few silver linings to the COVID era, but I am optimistic that 30 years from now, we'll look back and we'll say, that's a technology, that's a solution that saved a lot of lives and it came out of our response to COVID. There's a picture of someone receiving hand bag mechanical ventilation in the, COVID, in the, uh, in the polio era. All right, so what I'm not gonna talk about is clinical trials, because um, I think those are probably more familiar to people. We did participate in uh, remdesivir, anti-IL-6, a bunch of other therapies. I'm specifically gonna talk, on, talk about some things that our division and my collaborators through MSERC have participated in that tend to be more direct application of engineering solutions to critical care problems. Uh, one of them is this, this is a, you're hearing it on your screen too, but what you're seeing is a negative pressure hood for a heated high flow nasal cannula. This is not helmet ventilation, which is also very cool, but that's not our, um, uh, our, our innovation. This was a recognition that we were not gonna have enough negative pressure rooms for all the patients. We wanted to use heated high flow. Um, we had a concern for aerosol, aerosolization and it's not easy to suddenly scale up and make a lot of um, uh, negative pressure rooms. So this was inspired by something that's used in industrial painting. It's basically a personal negative pressure space that uses a shop vac. And we've actually got a factory in, factory in Royal Oak making these and we're working on distributing them so that they're more widely available. This is uh, in, the, in the sense of what's old is new again. This is a basically small portable iron lung. It's a negative pressure cuirass that uh, some folks in our engineering school. Um, and this was, we ended up not needing it, but part of our backup plan. If, if we uh, exhausted all of our other means of supportive ventilation, uh, we were going to whip out the old portable iron lung uh, using some new portable technology. Uh, this is what I warned you up front I was going to talk about um, that I do have a conflict in, but um, I, again, when it's not COVID era, I'm a microbiome guy who's sequencing techniques to study bacteria. Um, and quite recently, I've gotten interested in real-time metagenomic pathogen surveillance. So that's a lot of words. What do I mean by it? Um, it all stems from this technology. So this is something called a minion, which is, uh, this picture shows you for scale, is a sequencer you can hold in your hand. It's USB powered. It's made by a company in England called Oxford Nanopore. And it has, I think, the potential to transform the way we do sequencing. So if I have a question about a patient, I want to do metagenomics or, or, or Amplicon sequencing on a patient specimen, we talk, it's a number of weeks. I run 300 specimens at a time. It takes about 5,000 bucks. Whereas this thing, you can hold in the palm of your hand, you can do single specimens at a time, and you can do raw metagenomics with absolutely no filtering. So um, the way it works is pretty mind-blowing. This is, it's got a a uh, surface that has all these pores in it. The pores actually come from E. coli. And individual strands of DNA, one at a time, go through the pore. And then you can think of it as an EKG for the nucleic acid. So it's measuring the voltage across as the, as the strand goes through, and it gives you this squiggle. And you get a squiggle like this, and there's a base calling software that turns that into A's and G's and C's and T's. It interprets your EKG for you. Then we, computationally, take that nucleic acid sequence, align it with a human genome, and just say up, down, is it human or not? If it is, we throw it out. If it's not, we keep it. And whatever's left, the small minority of sequences that are there, that we then align with microbial databases. So this is how, as an example, we published this a few years ago. These are the guys in my lab that work with me on the project. That's my hand holding the, uh, my hand's there for skill. Uh, a patient in our ICU undergoes bronchoscopy at 11 in the morning, Within an hour, we're isolating DNA. By four o'clock, we started sequencing. And by nine o'clock that night, we identified Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And a full 24 hours after the bronchoscopy, Pseudomonas has grown. So again, this is not PCR. It's not like we have primers where you need to know what you're looking for. This is broad, agnostic, whatever is there is gonna get sequenced and identify it. So this is the first demonstration that you can use metagenomics to find pathogens faster than culture or even PCR-based. That was 10 hours to pathogen identification. We've got it down to four hours. And with my engineering colleagues, we think we can get it down to 30 minutes through a number of steps. The idea here is you get, I know I'm short on time, but uh, in fact, I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna move quickly through this. But um, what we're trying to address here is it took unacceptably long to get PCR primers for SARS-CoV-2 worldwide. We were still making decisions based on pretest probability and CT findings or X-ray findings, 
uh, when we should have had PCR kits. And that was for a lot of reasons. But the idea here is with this approach, you don't need primers. You don't need to have a company in Germany or, or in the CDC or anywhere uh, drive the primers, build the kits, and ship them out. If clinical micro labs were just running this direct specimen uh, metagenomics, you could use what we're calling digital primers. So you could just email, essentially, here's what you're looking for. And within minutes, rather than weeks or months, um, be on the lookout for a SARS-CoV-2 or a new emerging pathogen worldwide. Point of care, cytokine quantification. I mentioned we were part of the anti-IL-6, one of the many anti-IL-6 and other cytokine inhibition studies. Um, and I already explained my frustration where we're giving targeted therapy faster than we can detect whether the patient might benefit from it. We've just invested an anti-IL-6 course of treatment in a patient who it turns out had a normal anti-IL-6 uh, normal IL-6 level. Um, uh, Katsuo Kurobayashi is one of our engineers and Ben Singer is one of my colleagues in Plum Critical Care. They have something called Digital ELISA that should let us, the idea is uh, qu uh, quantify cytokines and other proteins as fast as we do a blood sugar or a troponin. So a point of care cytokine quantification. Uh, and they're doing that on COVID patients now with nice, strong congruence with what we get from the reference laboratory. Um, this is a cool project I'm excited about. So bedside chest CTs. Um, what you're seeing on the right side of the screen here is an actual in-use portable head CT scanner. We have one in our neuro ICU here. It's made by a company in Ann Arbor called Zoran. Um, I found out about it, got very excited about it, and last fall I tried to talk them into making a chest CT for us because I can think of a million applications in the ICU for a chest and abdominal CT scan. They weren't sure there was much of a market and I couldn't get them too excited about it. Here we are in the COVID era, they called me back, uh, and now the company has dropped everything and hopefully this video works. Let's see. That is a, they have dropped everything and they are now sprinting to give us uh, a uh, mobile um, low dose, low radiation uh, thoracic and abdominal CT scanner that we could use in our ICU. Um, and we are scrambling to get additional funding and, and pursue it. But um, I can think of this as being useful at the bedside in the ICU, ICU not just for ARDS, but um, for diagnosis, for prognosis. Um, uh, we have unstable patients that we don't want to transport down to radiology. Um, we have questions about who's going to thrive. You know, we, with COVID, have been frustrated that our predictive tools for getting people off the ventilator are not fantastic. We wonder if there's research questions, whether uh, changes in lung parenchyma might predict that. But also surge planning. Um, we came close to opening up a field hospital, but did not open it. Um, obviously, you can't just install a CT scanner if you're going to tur turn your track stadium into a hospital. So um, these things, if you're going to put a regular CT scanner somewhere, you need cement reinforced floors, you need three foot walls. This is a scanner that you could stockpile. And at the time of the next pandemic, we could just unleash them and, uh, and, and send them to where they're needed. And then finally, the last thing I'm going to share is exhaled breath metabolomics, which is another example of what's old is new again. Um, literally since Hippocrates, people have talked about making diagnosis by smelling the breath. The breath has hundreds of compounds that are made by the lungs and uh, detectable from the blood. Um, we know that in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis, their breath should smell like uh, juicy fruit from acetone. Um, uh, but we have done some work using exhaled breath to discriminate ARDS from other causes of hypoxic respiratory failure. Sherman Fan is the engineer who did this. It's a paper we published a year ago saying that with, with, with pretty good sensitivity and specificity, we could discriminate ARDS from, say, heart failure or non-ARDS causes of hypoxic respiratory failure. Um, it can be miniaturized. This is the size of it. Um, it can be done, um, it takes 20 minutes to turn around and, and get a readout on the specimens. So we are scaling this up and I, the dream here would be we can use it for diagnosis for not just ARDS but also respiratory infections. So bacteria are metabolically active. As a microbiome guy, I dream of the day that we um, diagnose and treat VAP, not based on clumsy things like x-rays and consistency of sputum and cultures that take 24 to 72 hours, but rather can we detect met a metabolic signature of reproducing pseudomonas? And we start and stop antibiotics based on their metabolic activity or their presence in the respiratory tract. Uh, rather than these, these really clumsy tools that are from the uh, century ago. Um, we have uh, reached out and are going to be collaborating with Jennifer Switerick, your own, uh, uh, from your, your MICU, uh, and would love to partner on this and other projects. Um, but this is what I think is a potentially transformative technology that's going to be, uh, it's gonna, its utility is, I think, going to outlast COVID-19, um, but COVID-19 gives us an amazing opportunity to study ARDS, which is going nowhere. So that's the end of the innovation section. I hope I persuaded you um, of the rather boring conclusion that patients with severe COVID-19 disease develop ARDS and should be managed accordingly. 
And with that, I will thank you for your time and hopefully have allowed at least some time for questions. I know we have got to get out of here a few minutes early. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Dixon. That was a really outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Uh, by the way, uh, Bob, can you give me the host? Uh, oh, sure. Let me, so uh, I can. So I can. Sure. So. Um, Should have just happened. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So, one of the uh, attendees. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Ala Busayev, um, he wanted to ask you a question. Uh, there's some data that we have here at the hospital. Ala, uh, you you can you can talk. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dixon, for uh, an amazing presentation oh, that uh, that supports what we have uh, so far found in Henry Ford. So, just briefly, uh, we went through five weeks of the pandemic with 30 days more t uh, 30 days outcome. We have 198 intubated patients with COVID, and we had no statistical difference in a bad compliance below 40. And the mm -hmm. only surrogate for survival or for mortality that we were able to find was hypoxia with a PF ratio below 150 at day three of intubation, which, which kind of is a, a common sense, more hypoxic than more yeah. higher mortality. So we, we do support uh, the findings you had in Michigan. I have to tell you, that we, we are in the work right now of comparing that group to severe non-COVID ARDS uh, in Henry Ford in the last quarter of 2019. So with your great work now, I have to twist our project a little <laughs> to have it published. But the, the question I have to you are the mortality rate. So when we did the literature search and we noticed very similar to what you mentioned, people were reporting a mortality rate either out of panic at the beginning or giving these low mortality rates with more than two thirds of the patients being still in house. But then came the Massachusetts paper and now your data are different than what we observed when, when people published their 30 days outcome. That includes Washington, that includes uh, another paper from China. And our cohort here at Henry Ford, we had a mortality of 65%. So that question in my mind is still to be answered, but I, but I hear you, your data in Massachusetts to be really low. We still, of course, I can later on in the future have meta-analysis to, to compare the severity of, of hypoxia, of lung compliance in these groups. And I have to, to mention, I don't know if Dr. Diaz and others will, will agree with me, that we were practicing disaster medicine in, in these two months. We we actually, out of these 65% mortality rates at Henry Ford, half of the patients uh, died after, you know, in the same day of changing code status. So changing code status into comfort care leading to death rather than dying from the disease itself in half of the patients. Uh, we did not offer ECMO, uh, although of course the, the, the mortality benefit of ECMO is out of, of, of a question. But I think that also plays a role in our high mortality compared to university centers like Massachusetts and Michigan, where the, the burden on the health system may not have been as bad as ours. These are the only points I wanted to make, and I really enjoyed your, your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those are insightful comments, and I agree with everything you said. And absolutely, one, one thing I'm optimistic about is that we're in an era now where we're all, you know, all these like single centers are publishing their experience and, and it's what we're working with. But soon, so uh, there's what's called the virus registry. So Society for Critical Care Medicine has this massive registry of patient level data on COVID-19. That's going to let us be much more systematic about looking at what are the factors that explain variation in mortality. And I couldn't agree more. We're used to thinking about what are the patient factors or provider factors, but the healthcare system factors are, I think, going to be the most determinant as far as how, how steep was your peak uh, and how much, how far into surge capacity and, and beyond it were you? I think that that explains why the initial reports out of China and Italy were so terrifying. It's just they, weren't, they, they could not have been prepared for it. Uh, and I think that is uh, obviously a, a really important determinant of it. So I couldn't agree more. Well, um, in lieu of the time, we're going to have to stop here. Very, I really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Dixon, for your um, outstanding lecture. Really 
you have opened uh, the eyes of many of us at this moment. And really, uh, thank you for showing the data and, 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 and everything that you have shown today. Uh, we really appreciate your time also uh, for being with us today and, and, and lecture us. Is there anything else that you would like to add on? Oh, no, I, uh, I, I would be happy to, well, I should mention that. So I mentioned that we're uh, uh, reached out to, to uh, collaborate regarding the Excel breath project, but I would love to forge more collaborations between uh, our, our two centers. We're just down the road from each other, but we have very complementary uh, uh, patient populations and, and a very common mission. So uh, I would be happy to take emails and, and, and phone calls with anyone who'd like to collaborate on any of these projects. Well, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Dixon. We really appreciate your time and, and, right, and, and you the, the information. Thank you. And thank, thank you for the invitation. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, also for attending. Goodbye.